All right, um, we are going to go ahead and get started this evening. So um, just to give you a bit of an overview, my name is Emily Hoffman. I am the PIO for WATMA, um, and I'm very glad that you all are joining us this evening. Um, <laughs> Um, just to give you a, a brief rundown, this is the agenda that we are planning on going through in um, today's uh, ODOR workshop. Um, if you notice at the end, there will be an opportunity for some questions and answers. So if you have your questions, um, please hold on to those until the end or feel free to add those into the chat or Q&A function within Zoom. Um, but we will go ahead and get started with some introductions. All right, so like I said, my name is Emily Hoffman. I am the PIO here for WAPMA. Um, I also want to introduce Keith Schmidt. He is the, um, <laughs> he's not that. What's your job title, Keith? <laughs> I'm at the bottom of this slide. Oh, okay, he's, oh, Keith is on there twice. Keith is a civil, senior civil engineer. Um, and then Will Scheffler who is a, uh, our operations superintendent, Stephanie Ulmer, who is an environmental resource specialist, and Jennifer Snyder, who is not on there, but she is also an environmental resources specialist. Um, I do also want to give um, a welcome to one of our board members, Pauline Ricucci from the city of Roseville. Um, so uh, now to give an overview of WAPMA, um, I'm going to turn over to Will. All right, thanks, Emily. <clears throat> the Western Placer Waste Management Authority with the Joint Powers uh, formed in 1978 to site, own, and operate the Western Regional Sanitary Landfill. Uh, since that time, Watmas facilities have grown, expanded, and adapted to support the community's evolving needs, uh, growth in, within Placer County, and the updated regulatory requirements of the state's waste diversion requirements. Uh, the WAPMA is governed by a board of directors comprising the various member agencies and represented by their elected officials. As Emily mentioned, Pauline Ricucci from Rozo, thank you very much for being here tonight. Bill Halladin from Rockland, uh, current board chair Dan Carlskint from Lincoln, Bonnie Gore from Placer County, and Robert Wygant, also from Placer County. All right. Um, now to talk a little bit about the WATMA's evolution throughout the years, I will turn it over to Keith Schmidt. Thank you, Emily. So in the 70s, solid waste regulations were changing and in a way that was more beneficial to protect groundwater, but in a way that's also more expensive. So the county and the cities got together and discussed options for potentially citing more regionalized landfills. And for the Western Placer County uh, side of the situation, they looked at nine sites in the area. Um, they are shown here in the hatched areas. Uh, the Athens Road and Fitment location where we're at today is clearly what they chose uh, among other reasons um, that was important to the agencies that the landfill be located fairly central to the cities that were likely to be growing and they certainly did over time such that the landfill is not in the middle of nowhere anymore and it's become kind of surrounded so in 1978 the landfill was all that was out here in terms of on the WATMA properties. Over time in the 1990s, uh, solid waste regulations changed again and the authority took advantage of an opportunity to build a materials recovery facility, what we call a MRF in 1995 and its first composting area. And then uh, about 10 years later, in order to get the public traffic field out of the main traffic for the MRF, we built a public tipping area and a buyback center that you may have used before. And then 2007, we expanded uh, the MRF again and added a separate construction demolition processing area and then expanded the composting area in 2012. So it's changed over time. 
um, certain processes have changed the odors produced. Uh, obviously, when you're running a landfill, you have the waste coming in. It's fairly fresh and it goes into the landfill within about a two day period of time by law. Uh, when we get into composting things, it can sit around for longer, but it depends on uh, what we do with it, how much odor potential it has. Uh, real quick, on the right of this diagram, you'll see a fairly small red box. That's about the area that of the landfill that is open from any time, uh, any day to day. We keep it pretty small to limit the amount of uh, odor potential. The rest of it is covered up with at least six inches, often two feet of dirt or more uh, to limit odors. When we studied odors, uh, the last one we did, uh, last study we did was in 2014. We came up with these uh, compositions of like the prevalence of odors on site. Composting was uh, the biggest one. So it's about 70% of the odors detected on site came from uh, composting. And then next in line would be landfill gas. Uh, when you put this much trash in one place, it decays and makes landfill gas. And that odor, uh, although less prevalent than composting, can sometimes be pretty um, irritating, I'd say. Uh, so that's one we watch as well. Then the active landfill areas, like we noted before, it's a pretty small section of the landfill that is actually uh, open at any given point. So that didn't end up being very much of an odor contributor. And then the MRF itself as well is pretty small, nearly negligible. negligible. Uh, there are some other uh, businesses in the area that can produce odors. Some of them are in fact pretty similar to what the SILDI here will produce, such as the yellow areas, which handle wood waste. We also process wood waste and green waste here. Um, so some of those areas can produce a similar smell to what you might find if you were here on site. Um, the red areas are, um, Wastewater treatment plant type facilities. Oh, sorry, those are the blue. Red areas are the um, cattle and poultry operations. So if you smelled manure, sometimes that can be coming from those areas as well. We do accept um, sewage sludge here uh, still today. I think that's going to decline over time, but for now we get, do get some sewage sludge, sludge loads. They're buried right away, but they do still smell on the way here and for the uh, maybe half hour or so that they're still out in the open before we can bury them. And then, the, like I said, the blue areas where the wastewater treatment plants, those often don't typically smell uh, unless you're right there at the plant, but sometimes it can smell and we do get some notifications from time to time related to those facilities. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Emily. All right. Thank you, Keith. Um, now to talk about the odor monitoring system, as well as our site-wide odor plan, um, I will turn it on over to Jennifer Snyder. Thanks, Emily. The WANTMA utilizes a site-wide continuous odor monitoring and dispersion modeling system and weather station to provide objective, quantifiable visual representations of the probable off-site odor concentrations associated with the WAMA's operations. For those of you that have submitted odor notifications, this is a system um, where we're able to compile those video clip um, information that we sent to you and include on the odor notification response forms. Another key feature of the odor monitoring system is the reverse trajectory model that predicts the path of a theoretical odor particle based on data from our on-site weather station. As depicted on this slide, the reverse trajectory route highlighted in purple represents the likely pathway of the odor particle beginning at the location of where the odor was experienced, shown at T minus zero minutes, and backtracking to its location 60 minutes earlier, shown at T minus 60 minutes. If the pathway crosses or is near our facility, like what's shown in this example, 
we would consider ourselves in addition to one of the nearby non watma facilities to be responsible for the reported odors. If the pathway does not cross or isn't near our facility, like what's shown in this example, then we wouldn't attribute the experienced odors to us. This is the newest addition um, to our odor monitoring system that was completed last September. We installed offsite odor sensors along our perimeter fence line and in nearby public parks immediately south of us in Roseville. The purpose of these sensors is to provide an early indication of odor and ambient air, which allows us to send staff to the locations for preemptive investigations so that we can identify and address odor issues before they are experienced by the public. In December 2020, the site-wide odor plan, also known as the SWAP, was approved by the WATMA board and provides an overview of our facilities and services, potential operational odor sources, and associated mitigation measures implemented at the facility. The SWAP is intended to be used as a tool by the WATMA and its facility operators, contractors, and consultants to consistently and proactively take appropriate steps to reduce the potential for off-site odors, as well as assist local regulators in evaluating community concern and potential non-compliance issues related to odors. In January, 2021, the WAMA formally began implementing the SWAP, including a variety of best management practices, regular on and off-site odor monitoring, continued public education and outreach, and researching new odor reduction and monitoring technologies. A part of the SWAP's best management practices includes reviewing daily odor risk reports generated by the odor monitoring system and adjusting operations as necessary. Weather forecast data is used to prepare these three-day odor risk predictions that identify periods of time on an hourly basis where there could be an increased potential for odors to be experienced by nearby areas. The odor risk forecast is updated daily and provided to the facility operator, allowing them to plan their operations to minimize the potential for offsite odors. Operational adjustments are made when there is either any continuous three hour period where each hourly risk potential is noted as high or any continuous six hour period where each hourly risk potential is noted as moderate or high. Um, and you can see a couple of examples um, circled in red here on this particular odor risk report. Uh, and now, uh, so an example of operational adjustments that we would make, um, say for uh, these two identified um, high odor risk time periods would be postponing um, the screening or grinding of compost um, to a later time so that we can do it um, when the odor risk level is at low. Another part of the swap um, is conducting weekly on and off site odor monitoring to evaluate and record the type and intensity of odors that have the potential um, to be experienced by nearby receptors. Odors are monitored at six on site locations and 12 off site locations. On this particular slide, this is identifying the six on site locations. Um, the four, let's see on here. So it's Murph Ponds, North Compost Pad, South Compost Pad, and Landfill Active Face. We visit these each week um, just due to the odors that these operations cause. And uh, the location located on the Southern Perimeter Road as well as the Eastern Perimeter Line, um, those are more of like a preemptive monitoring just to um, gauge how facility um, odors may be migrating across the site, if at all. Now, here are the 12 um, offsite locations I'd mentioned earlier. Um, we visit these so that we can understand what odor conditions might be in the area um, so that we can take a proactive approach if, you know, for some reason we're out there and we do detect odors that are um, attri attributable to our facility. Um, it allows us to go back um, identify the source of the odors and uh, just take a proactive approach so that we can apply operations so that um, the issue is hopefully resolved before uh, nearby residents are able to um, detect those same odors. And 
One final note on the odor monitoring. Um, we uh, started utilizing a nasal ranger while we were out performing these weekly um, monitoring investigations, as well as when we're doing odor investigations in response to the odor notifications we receive. Uh, this is just a way of further quantifying the odors that may be out there. Um, and uh, what this piece of, of equipment is, is it's called a nasal ranger. Um, and it is an instrument that is used to measure odor strength in ambient air, which um, is just helpful in providing an objective and quantifiable analysis of real-time field conditions. And with that, I will pass it back to Emily. All right, thank you. Um, so now to talk about SB 1383 and reducing short-lived climate pollutants, I will turn it back over to Will Scheffler. Thank you, Emily. Uh, good evening again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, SB 1383, also short-lived climate pollut pollutants, was a monumental law signed back in September 2016, uh, which will impact Californians on some sort of every level imaginable. Uh, the vision of SB 1383 was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 40% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. Uh, it's established to reduce, meth green, reduce methane emissions across industries in California's entire co economy, uh, most prevalently the solid waste industry. Uh, as you can see here in this pie chart, uh, CalRecycle estimates that pre-SB 1383 landfilling uh, waste stream comprises two thirds of it being organic. In nature. So the two goals of SB 1383 most prominently advertised is a reduction in organic waste disposal of 50% by 2020 and a 75% reduction in organic waste uh, disposal by the year 2025. Uh, please note these numbers are based on 2014 uh, waste disposal numbers. Uh, since 2014, California, California's population has grown. So it's in actuality a bigger increase than 50% and 75% as advertised. So what exactly is organic waste? So CalRecycle defines organic waste as any solid waste that contains materials originate from living animals and their met metabolic process, processes. So most prevalently, this would be food waste, uh, landscape, green material, lawn clippings and such. Uh, any organic textiles and carpets made in organic nature, uh, lumber, uh, wood byproducts, paper products, and then manure, biosolids, uh, the digestate from wastewater treatment plants, and sludge. So as the slide says, Cal Recycle estimates that 100 new or expanded organic recycling facilities will be needed statewide to meet SB 1383's goals. In addition to this, it's estimated that an additional 20 to 25 million tons of organic waste will need to be composted, recycled, or recovered in some shape or form annually on top of what the industry is currently doing to meet these goals. So as Keith mentioned, back in the 90s, the facility expanded to add composting operations. Uh, the, the WAPMA has been composting since 1995, so WAPMA is uniquely uh, and ideally situated to comply with these additional more stringent requirements. Uh, currently, the WAPMA is composting food waste of a commercial origin from an area stack pile. So uh, versus the old compost method of making windrows and turning them in open air with a tractor that obviously volatilizes a lot of odors, uh, this would be in some windrow pile that has air injected to it, and the entire pile is covered for the duration of the compost cycle, thereby reducing odors uh, up to 90% uh, during that process. And for that, I'll turn it back over to Emily. Great, thank you, Will. So now I will turn it over to Keith Schmidt to talk about some of the facility improvements uh, that will be coming to WATMA. Thank you, Emily. As Will noted, uh, with SB 1383 coming around in 2016, uh, there were a few years ahead of that that uh, some other laws, too, were pointing that direction. And 
the authority board uh, directed staff to begin investigating ways to handle this uh, change where we essentially have organics that used to go to the landfill now being directed to go in our case uh, to some other system, but in our case to a composting system. And uh, one of the things that we've done with that is that we began a competitive procurement process to get a new facility operations contract. And what that resulted in is that uh, a new company, well, new to our area, FCC, began operation on July 1st. Uh, with their proposal to operate, they've also submitted and the Waste Management Authority Board has approved and executed a contract to improve the facility, starting out with first, um, as of a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, we are now doing aerated static pile type composting of the food waste, which if you've been to any of these meetings before, you've heard us talk about that being in the works and a, a pilot that we did with uh, the prior op operator Nortec for a few years that seemed to work pretty well. So that's permitted and in action now. Uh, so we expect to see some reduction in food waste related composting odor, odors using that aerated static pile composting method, which has some better control. Uh, when FCC gets further along the way, um, they will end up renovating the MRF uh, to recover organics from the waste stream. So they'll be obligated to, re to pull 60% uh, of the material that comes into that facility out for recycling. And of the, um, organic component of that material, they'll have to pull 75% out. And that material will go uh, in a covered conveyor, thankfully over to the organics processing area where it will be introduced into something like windrows and then covered with what's called a gore cover, which is like a thick plastic cover. So two improvements there, in that it's covered in a conveyor on its way there instead of in an open truck. And that it's uh, from an odor standpoint covered uh, once it's underway and will stay there until it, may, it moves through that more odiferous process uh, or component of the composting process. And then, and I know this was mentioned before, the, the MRF, the air within the MRF has the potential to cause odors um, when we're actively pulling out uh, organics, it might be more odiferous. So FCC has also proposed to install this, what's labeled here is the cold ox um, uh, central air handling unit. And it's not a complete um, scrubbing of all the air in the MRF, but it's a large enough component of it to where it'll keep the odors in check inside the building so that in the case they blow out of the building as the wind moves by, it won't, uh, it's not anticipated to create more odors. And all that is is a UV reactor and a dual activated carbon bed and some exhaust fans. So I think there's about six of these that they'll be installing. And uh, that project to renovate the MRF will happen in a few more years. It's under design now. I think the project delivery date is early 2025 in total. Uh, here's a picture of what that Gore cover looks like. And shout out to Bonnie Gore. This is not her design. <laughs> she is one of our directors, but Gore is some company name that, for, that makes compost covers. Uh, so essentially it's uh, the compost, when it's made into windrows, it's like tucked underneath this long, uh, plastic bag so there's no more air coming in and out in an uncontrolled fashion. So some exciting improvements uh, that we believe will help address uh, future odors from the requirement to address 1383 are coming down uh, to us thanks to the board's approval of all these projects. Great. Pass that back to Emily. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Stephanie Ulmer, who will be talking about Renewable Placer, the Waste Action Plan. Thank you. 
So in addition to the MRF improvements that Keith talked about, um, back in 2015, the WATMA began a master planning process now known as the Renewable Plaster Waste Action Plan. That plan was necessary to address current and future solid waste needs of our growing community by developing practical solutions that prioritize what's important to residents. And that is maintaining Placer County's quality of life and the ease and convenience of the current waste collection programs. Um, the plan will ensure compliance with new regulations like 1383, and it will position Placer as a leader in innovative resource recovery through establishment of a local circular economy. So some of the challenges that prompted the master planning um, project were that we're nearing our existing operational capacity and we needed to identify additional capacity to process more organics as required by 1383. Um, also the collapse of global recycling markets, which I'm sure you've heard of by now, as well as a rapidly growing Placer County population and planned development surrounding the authorities facilities, which will essentially transition the area from a more rural environment to a more urban one. So again, this is the existing land use surrounding the authorities facilities. And all of this color is the planned land use that's coming. So we will no longer be in the middle of nowhere. Um, and that is, you know, some of these projects are actually beginning construction as we speak. So um, with every challenge comes opportunity, and some of the opportun opportunities that we're seeing include enhancing compatibility with the current and future neighbors surrounding us, and providing a safeguard for future generations with additional capacity to support regional growth while maintaining local control and fostering innovation and economic growth. So our board decided to take two master planning project concepts through um, California's environmental review process. So both concepts were evaluated equally and the authority circulated an environmental impact report for public review and feedback back in October of 2021. We anticipate presenting the final EIR to our board for certification next month. And at the same time, they will be tasked with approving one of the two projects. So to give you an idea of what these projects may look like in the area, uh, we created a visualization tool to help um, residents understand current operations and to showcase some proposed features of the waste action plan. The tool depicts various project elements um, in the year 2050 and then at final project build out. So this view shows existing operations and each little circle has a drop down explanation of that area of the facility. And then another feature is the ability to see the plan concepts at different build out periods from various vantage points surrounding our properties. So if I was curious as to what the facilities might look like when I go down to the Thunder Valley Casino, I would select view eight. And then you could see if you were lucky enough to be in the penthouse up there at the hotel, you could look out and see what potentially the landfill will look like. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so some key dates. Again, our final EIR, we anticipate um, circulating for public release in October, and then taking that to our board in November for certification and project selection. As Keith mentioned, that Gore covered ASP composting is anticipated to be operational in November of 2024. And the MRF upgrades will be completed and operational by February of 2025. Great. Thank you, Stephanie, for that overview of Renewable Placer. Um, so at this time, there is an opportunity for um, some Q&A. Um, and so if you have questions that you would like answered, we ask that you put those um, in the chat in Zoom or within or or you can raise your hand um, within Zoom as a function as well, and we can unmute you and you can ask your question. So, 
let us know if you have any questions. Our first question is gonna come from uh, Karen Pacheco. Hi, um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Thank you. 